Hello and welcome to my uh, live painting demo tonight, Tuesday, September 9th, September 18th, sorry, and uh, we will be painting um, this photo that I got off a sketchy of this young girl in a sundress with a beautiful face. I um, did an initial drawing um, quickly over in my Instagram um, page, Instagram Live, and um, now I will be starting in the painting part. And so, um, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I see that there's a couple people already, um, already here. Should be live. I believe it is, even though it says three waiting. So let me refresh the page just to make sure that. Um, oh, yep, I am. Okay, three watching. That's better. Um, so if you can, um, just. Uh, send a, a chat comment let me know that you're who you are and where you're watching from i always like to see um, where in the world people are i just had someone recently write me um, on instagram that they thought i was talking about thursday night because it was already wednesday for them where they um where they are in new zealand so a little bit of confusion there when i say tuesday night i think i have to be um, clear that it's Tuesday night where I am, but it might be a different date wherever you are in the world. Okay, so let's get started. I'm just going to mix a little bit of uh, a half tone color, which is sort of the average. Well, can't really call it a half tone because it's going to be the shadow area of her face, which is um, the part of that would naturally fall in, into shadow. Um, and then the part, the cast shadow from her hair. And then she has the light side of her face has dapple lighting that's coming through her hair. So I'm looking to get kind of that sort of brownish rosy kind of, there's sort of yellows and pinks in there. I do want to keep the color fairly intense because the colors will tend to gray a little bit as I um, continue to work. That looks like a little bit too dark. So I'm going to go ahead Add a little bit of white or a little bit of yellow. Come back a little bit with my uh, naphtha red and let's see if that's a better color, a better value, I should say. Uh, that might not be too bad to start off with. The danger is actually ending up going too too light on this side of the face, so I'm gonna doesn't hurt for me to start just a little bit darker. And I can make another um, pool of color that's just a little bit lighter so I can throw in just a little bit of uh, the light. Her face is going to be very round, um, so I'm not going to have, um, shouldn't have any um, hard jumps in value from one um, spot to another. Just going to paint around her the drawing a little bit so I don't lose lose that. And then you can see there's quite a bit of green and yellow that's reflecting up into her chin. You need to go light enough there so that you feel that ref light reflection. And it also may feel a little bit green against the the red of her lips. So, and I did not give her enough cheek in the drawing. So I'm going to start, I'm going to break that line where I drew and then just come out a little bit further with both the, the cheek line and where the ear is. And I got to go lighter on the earlobe, something more like that. And that's, that's not too bad because I can see once I start to come in with the darkest dark, which is some of the black that's in the underside of her hair there, that I'm going to start to see much better that value that's there. The value of the, the earlobe. Okay. Okay, I see I have Carol Clay He's watching from Texas. Um, didn't have anyone watching from the from the southern United States um, last week, and I think part of that was because of um, of Hurricane Florence. I think a lot of people were hunkering down, especially in the southeast, and um, so a lot of people were watching from Canada, Michigan, and Vermont, and not so much from from the north 
northeast or even from the south and so welcome and I have Marion Glazer here um, and uh, Melania great I'm glad you're um, you're joining in um, curious whether you're going to be also um, drawing along um, along as well um, I am actually going to do I'm going to step away for just a second because um, if you can still hear me I'm going to grab some of my um, safflower oil and I'm going to pour that into my um, into my thinner back you might be able to hear me better now um, one problem that I've been having is that I'm working on so many paintings at the same time that I'll have to put one down for several days while I try to um, make progress on other ones and so what happens is my um, I like to paint wet into wet and just because I've let the painting sit for a few days it does um, dry up and then um, and I haven't really had enough experience painting into dry paintings that um, there is something you can do called oiling out, which is a way of re-wetting the surface of the painting, even if you're not, even if you're not re able to um, re-wet the paint itself, the surface. So when you go to paint into it, you're not painting onto uh, a, a a painting that has paint down already but it's dried and dried paint tends to really suck up oil much more than the um, bare panel itself you have to excuse me I'm unwrapping this other bottle of oil making a lot of noise um, so what I this is um, I don't know if you can see it I'm gonna put it in front of the camera um, like, okay yep there we are a little bit of delay there this is um, not what I wanted to grab. This is a var This is a um, varnish, so not what, not what I'm going to pour in there. So I'm going to put this back down. And I thought I had another um, bottle of oil, but I don't think I do. Okay. Well, that's okay. I poured a little bit in there. The idea is that um, this is what I poured in there. This is a very beat up bottle of Gamblin Safflower oil. And safflower oil is one of the binders in some of their paint colors. They use both linseed and safflower oil. And the safflower oil is um, has a higher um, clarity to it. It's not as yellow as the linseed oil. And so they tend to use it in colors that they want to have a, a cleaner, brighter um, um, color uh, hue to it. Um, and they have something that would be just like titanium white instead of the linseed has the safflower oil in it and that's actually what I'm using in this um, uh, let's see if I can find the tube it's called radiant white it's right here um, I already got a big thumb smudge on it but it's um, radiant white and it um, it is basically has titanium and then it says safflower oil and so it's really just the same as titanium white, but it it's, um, has a brighter sort of finish because it's much cooler because it doesn't have that, that yellow from the, um, from the linseed oil. If you're really look, working on a painting that you want overall a very warm, um, a warm undertone to it, then using um, titanium white, and they have some other colors like... Uh, um, I forget the name of it, but there's a couple of colors that are that are um, of white that are much yellower, and I think one is a lead replacement white, which is a little bit warmer, and um, and like that. Um, so, okay, so Marion's not painting tonight, um, and Melania says yes, yeah, been on vacation, but. Um, don't know if she, uh, if that means that you're painting or not painting, but that's okay. Um, and I'm going to continue trying to get a little bit of coverage down. The forehead here is uh, 
is a bit um, yellower and lighter. I don't have enough orange down on my palette, so at some point I'm going to have to dig in and pull some out. And I'm going to grab also a little bit of a smaller brush to get the um, around the eyes. I do want to be a little bit more careful with the details there, have a little bit more control. And the brush that I have is a fairly beat up um, filbert brush, so I'm not going to really have a, a corner or a tip or an edge to really um, be that accurate with detail. Let me just get a little bit of lighter yellow down here, just kind of mass it in a little bit just to um, get the feeling of the paint. I've been a little bit too tentative with my paintings lately and I'm not getting the that sort of thickness of the paint that I kind of really like in other people's paintings. So sometimes you can see it but then too afraid to do it yourself when it comes to your own painting and that's I've been suffering from that just a little bit. So just going to get a little bit of thicker paint down right away. And that'll force me to paint thicker in general. And then I want for the lips, her lips are kind of on the cooler side of the red spectrum or the red hue. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of crinacridone red, and which is a, a fairly cool red, and then a, um, fairly dark and cool is the um, alizarin permanent. That again is a um, gambling color. All the colors that I'm currently using are gambling colors. Okay, and so that's, and then I can come in with a little bit of naphthol red right here on the top part of her lower lip where it gets a little bit lighter and then I'm just for kicks hold on I kind of messed up the separation there on her lips so I'm losing where that is and just for kicks I am going to throw in a bit of a highlight on her lower lip just really want to jump start that sense of um, 3D so I can really start to see it as I'm painting. So I really want to get um, start to dig in and feel the the dimension of um, her lips there. Let's put in a little bit of that shadow on the upper upper lip, and I'm going to carve into that a little bit. And then um, if I'm really paying attention, there's this very very dull pink, but very light dull pink that's hitting the underside of her upper lip and that is then that is the reflection of her dress mostly I put that in a little bit clumsily so I'm gonna have to come back and um, refine it a little bit once I get a smaller brush in my hands and now it's time for that smaller brush so what I've been using a late as of late for detail is that I have a fairly old uh, bristle brush. I Maybe you can see it here. It's been worn down so it has about 10 hairs that kind of come to a little bit of a curly point. And with that I can get a lot of control, um, almost like a detail brush, and come in and put in little bits of detail. So for example, I'm just going to um, draw in the outline of her iris right here going to correct some of the drawing that's there something like that and then I can do the same thing with where the line of um, her eyelid is with um, with a little bit of the lashes that define the outline of that and then I'm going to go throw in some phthalo blue with some white for the um, the light part of her eye, and that, and that's I'm not making it very light. I'm making it more blue than than light because um, I want to reserve the whitest lightest lights for some of the highlights in her face. 
and little and some bits in her eye that um, that are reflecting the main light source. Okay, something like that. And then once I make some corrections to get sort of the proper shape of her eye, then that, that'll start to look um, more correct. She looks a little bug-eyed at the moment, but that, that'll be fixed up once I start to get a little bit of the color that's around her eye. Okay, y'all with me still? Great. Okay, um, Sarah Truell wrote, Hi, AJ, finally caught you live. I run a live drawing class on Tuesdays, so I usually have to watch the recordings. Love watching you paint. Um, what an adorable model. Yeah, she is beautiful. I did paint her about two years ago. Um, my, my skills weren't quite as, um, as robust as they are now, but I thought I did a, a pretty good job some of the the lights that I put in her nose and that drawing just look more like um, a spotty coloration on her face and not so much a light um, the light effect so um, that's one of the problems that I saw with the drawing that I did at that time um, now I've learned to control some of those subtleties a little bit better and values so those things I've been having less problem with getting those kind of things to read so sometimes it's fun to redo old um, old attempts to see how you can, once your skills improve, how much better you're able to do them. Um, I went back to a little bit bigger brush, which um, let's see if I can get enough control to do our nostrils with that um, or just start to rough them in. Nothing has to be perfect because you can always come back in with the paint and um, do a little bit of correction around the edges until until you've got it um, saying and doing what you want. Um, and I do a lot of squinting. That's just, um, you have a choice, basically. If you're going to um, try to um, see sort of more of the general forms that are in the face or a painting, is you can squint or you can turn off the lights, turn down the lights, or you can um, step away from the painting and get some distance on it. Unfortunately, my studio is so small, it is really hard, um, well, especially during these live demos, to get enough distance to reduce down some of the distracting noise in the, in the paint and in the photo itself, um, so that you can start to see where, where things might be off a little bit. And so I tend to do that. I tend to squint a lot as I'm painting so that I can kind of um, see the more general um, shapes and values. OK. Um, just make sure that I go dark and red enough underneath the hair there so that um, when I start to put in that hair, it really um, will. Um, read sort of what's overlapping what. Really want to get this sort of angle to her face. I have this line here and I need to make sure that this cheek, this other cheek, does a kind of preserving that um, that roundness in her face that it like is round all the way up through here the rest of her head and uh, not just um, cutting her short. And that's, that's a really easy mistake to make is just um, not, um, not getting that contour right that really um, accentuates how round her face is. So I can just actually come in with a little bit of some reds mixed with a little bit of gray just to get some darker, darker edge. And then I can then start to... Um, describe her chin a little bit and come in and define those that shape a little bit better. Let's make sure I stay red enough here. I can start to play around with this graphic shape of the cutout of her sundress. It's about a little bit further there than the drawing. 
and then I want just about the only shadow, pure shadow in this painting. I mean, it's not getting light from the front or underneath, and it's not getting light from the main light source. It's right here underneath her chin. Okay, that's good. Cut her nose a little bit tighter here. Okay, so I can even start to see a little bit the um, that sense of light that's hitting on top of her nose because there's enough value difference here. What I don't have is she's got almost the lightest <clears throat> spot on her face is right here on the lip. And then she has a shadow, again, it's blocked from the top and the bottom right alongside that lightest light and trying to just mix that color a little bit um, and so just mix it up so it's gray enough okay that's good and there and then I'm going to refine the shape of her lips a little bit I'm really squinting hard now because I really want to see I'm looking back and forth between the photo and the painting as I make those marks because I want to try to get it as accurately as possible and that shadow underneath her chin comes actually in a little bit tighter than what I what I have it to make her chin a little bit more delicate um, and then quite a bit of orange on the outside of her cheek here I really want to get the fullness of that cheek. Okay, that's great. Um, just want to make sure you that the sound is okay as I go. I've had those technical problems where the sound started looping a few weeks ago. Although if it's doing that, you wouldn't be able to hear me ask you if the sound's okay. Um, but I guess if I hear back from one of you, that's a little bit um, reassuring. Um, see there's about nine of you in here that's that's good that's a some some weeks I only get like two or three people tuning in um, okay sounds great great okay wanna soften up this transition a little bit here all that softness is going to really play into that sense of fullness and she actually has this very thin green uh, reflected light along the outer edge and I'm actually not going to see it really until I put in some um, darker darks let me pull some brushes out of here had too too many brushes in my um, in my cleaning fluid there so I can actually get um, the brushes in very easily okay so I just want to come in with some black 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 come in and need it pretty wet. My uh, surface has um, just one coat of gesso, but it's um, has quite a bit of, um, what do you call that, like um, calc chalk in it that um, makes it very grabby and um, has a lot of tooth in it. And so that just, um, if I make the paint very wet, it's, it has to be if I'm going to put down kind of a more flowing stroke initially. And then I need to go even darker for the hair that's there against the, the background. And I'm just going to throw a little bit of green here around that to help set that off a little bit. Okay, so now I can see the edge of that cheek a little bit, and then she her earlobe there is fairly p light and pink something like that maybe even a little bit lighter let's go the light is hitting more the underside of that and just you know just with a few strokes there I can really start to get a sense of um, where that ear is sitting in space getting the right value and placement okay got a little bit of contamination of white there in my black so I'm gonna try to get a little bit fresher um, black coming across and the black that I'm using now I've just changed my color um, some items on my color palette the black I'm using is chromatic black and again that's a gamblin 
on paint. And that is a mixture of, um, let me see if I can pull it out, if you bear with me a second. Um, yeah, so this is, that's the ivory black. That's not helping me. Um, here. Okay. So this is chromatic black. I got the um, 150 milliliter tube because I'll go through a lot of it. And um, if I read the label here, it will say that it um, has the thalo um, cyan and cranacridone. So it's really a mixture of two colors, which is the cranacridone red and the in the thalo blue um, or thalo green actually I think it is and those are the exact opposite each other on the color wheel and neutralize um, their color um, perfectly and one um, additional quality of those two colors is they're both extremely um, transparent so it allows you to you can paint fairly thickly but you're still getting something that's sort of like a glaze and that if you put enough layers down or enough um, thick paint, then you're starting to get something like a very um, velvety black that um, absorbs a lot of light. And so that you can end up with a very rich black, even though it doesn't seem to be as um, quite as dark or as black as the ivory black. I've been able to get something that's um, fairly flat and dark, um, like ivory black um, from from this chromatic black. Another benefit is that when you start to mix it with other colors, it doesn't the hue doesn't shift quite as much as when you're mixing with ivory black. If you mix it like oranges with ivory black, you get something that's fairly green, and you do start to get a greening effect with this because it is a cool. A fairly cool neutral but not quite to the extreme as the um, as the ivory black and that matter if you're using something like Mars black then you're also introducing a, a warmer some warmer undertones to your color and then getting some other types of shifts in the color when you do mix the black with it okay so I am gonna grab my smaller brush again if I can find it um, there it is. And I'm going to start to refine the eye, that eye a little bit. I want it to really feel like when you look at it that you're seeing um, this girl's eye. So I'm going to go in and put in sort of these, um, if I can get enough value control, some of these marks that are in there that help define the shape of her eye. So I'm going to have this little bit of light that's around that edge. And by getting some of the whites into the blue there that's along the iris also, then that's going to help make the eye feel like it's turning along with some of the other things, the shape of the eye and some of the the, the lights and darks that are around the eye will start to give it a little bit more form. That's kind of one of the focal points of this painting, so I really want that to, to read well. If I look at the iris, it does look like it's pointing in the wrong direction. So part of that is that the far white in her eye is just still too light, and so it doesn't properly feel like it's turning away from us. So what I just darkened it up a little bit, that did um, help just a smidge. And wanna move that light around a little bit so it's not quite so spotty. Okay, that's starting to look right. I do need to better define the darks in her lower lid there to, so that you can feel that sort of turning away from us underneath and I do need to come then lighter again here in this side just a little bit come on well now I have some paint there so I really have to 
overcompensate a little bit to get that. And then I'm just going to throw in even lighter than it actually is, just this little pin spot of um, reflection from the highlight. And this is just, um, I guess it's coming in almost straight on to her face from where the viewer is. And I'm not really sure what that what that light is exactly. It could be a reflection off of something, but strong enough that it's reflecting out of the the dark of her eye, the, the dark of her iris. And I have her just a tad too wide-eyed, so I'm going to carve in a little bit of that eyelid. And again, I'm looking back and forth as I'm painting it to make sure I'm getting giving it the right shape. And again, I'm going to reinforce that the lashes on her lower eyelid. Need to go a little bit with some pure black. There we go. Okay, so that's starting to get there. Right away, I can see that the outer edge of her face is not dark or green enough to get that form to turn. So I'm just going to go in and throw, try to get that, as well as the greens that are starting to kind of the olive green colors that are showing up around her eye, which olive green is just like a little bit of, um, if you don't have like an um, olive green straight out of the tube, then you can start to mix some other greens with oranges and yellows to get um, that kind of coloration. That's a little bit better. Okay, starting to see a little bit this, when I said that there was a little bit of green reflected back into her face there. That's this right here, this edge. Okay. And then um, need to just move the, the bottom of her nose over just a little bit. Um, just to, you know, pay attention to some of that detail to get the things to turn in space. So that's a darker, even darker edge there, feeling a little brownish, so I don't quite have enough yellow mixed in with the red and the black. Okay, I think a little bit more orange. Okay, I almost have to get some spot of pure orange, and again, I said I don't, don't have enough orange on my palette, so I'm really kind of fighting a little bit this dry clump of orange paint. So let me pull some of that out. Um, it's just going to take a second. So I use orange. It's a permanent orange. Here's the tube right here. Permanent orange, another gambling color. I buy all my colors in 150 milliliters just because um, I go through enough paint that it's more economical. I did also look into the 8 ounce or 16 ounce um, jars of gambling paint. Those are a little bit unwieldy because you have to open it up and then scoop out some color and then if you're not careful the uh, colors tend to dry in the tins. The tubes are much better for longevity and um, and I did the math and it's not um, it's only slightly cheaper than the tubes um, by milliliter so I found overall that um, the 150 milliliter was really my best, um, the best value for me, um, given how I paint. So, and I do use the Artist Colors. Gamblin also makes uh, their 1980 colors, which is a student grade color, a student grade color, and that is really good if you're a student and you're just learning how and you just need paint that has um, that isn't so wildly intense but it has a fair amount of body to it that it allows you to more cheaply put out a lot of um, color out on your palette so you can get into painting more of impasto um, I think it's really um, typical for students to 
under um, to not put out enough volume of color and that really affects their ability to paint so that's really important to um, and in that case the student grade colors really do help and 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 overall um, they using similar pigments it just um, has more filler in it so you don't have quite the intensity of pigment um, that you do in the artist grade colors and for me since I um, have a high key palette and I really depend on the intensity of the color to get some of the colors that I'm trying to mix into the painting that I really do need the artist grade to be able to to um, work on my painting not that I couldn't use substitute in some cases a student grade color um, where I have more grays in a painting but but it's just easier for me to work just having all um, to have all artists grade and you know this is the only place where I really splurge in my life so I might as well do it do it there buying the paints that I need okay great so again there's a lot of subtlety here I'm gonna have to come in quite a few more times to to work out some of that do have this little bit of light here that's along the edge of the eye and so one of the things that I do when I paint is that I, I'm painting a bunch of little areas, um, hopefully close to the right, have it in the right spot and the right value. Um, so as I put in all those um, values in little bits and pieces, I don't always have them so that they're all relating to one another. And so then it, it, sometimes it takes me coming back in and looking at the overall painting to see where um, some of these little pieces don't tend to be supporting the, the overall idea and then I have to come in and um, and really um, pay attention to all those alignments and relative um, colors and values to get it all to work. I'm going to lighten up this area that's around her face. I can go quite a bit lighter and still support the that um, that light um, reflected light in her cheek so I'm going to do that because I really do want to make her the shape of her hair very graphic and so I need um, some bright um, and contrasting color around her hair um, there's not as uh, that much of it in the photograph and so I just really want to um, exaggerate that or play with that from a design um, standpoint is to really get some bright color around around her hair so taking a little bit of liberty with the photograph there but I think um, I will be forgiven if the result is good and I will keep on going here going ahead looking um, looking back and forth between the painting and the photo and then adjusting some things um, to get it closer to the color and value range in that photo really trying to get the fullness of the cheek it's quite a challenge there but once you start to get close then the whole thing starts to just pop out it's really in my mind this is why I paint for those little things that just um, give you such delight by because it just fools the eye that something is so dimensional when you know your brain knows it's flat but when you look at it you can't get you can't get your brain to process what it is exactly, and that's um, and that's the art of it. It looks dimensional when you know it's not. Just um, recently, was at the Brandywine River Museum. This is um, where um, N. C. Wyeth's um, house and studio was, um, and then where um, Andrew Wyeth grew up, and then eventually lived. Um, and painted. Uh, actually, I'm not actually sure. I think he did spend some time up in, I want to say, Maine. Um, and anyway, so this is a museum made from the property and residence of where um, N.C. Wyeth lived. And um, I forgot where I was going with this. Um, so I'll have to come back um, to that point in a minute. <laughs> 
um, it must have been something about one of the, the paintings. Anyway, I just left my brain, so I guess I'm getting at some early onset something going on there. So I'll just um, keep on keep on painting there until it comes back to me. I'm sure it had something to do with um, taking some liberties with the photographs or something like that. Okay. Um, but anyway, if you have a chance to go to the Brandywine River Museum, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful location, and they have some really um, beautiful um, paintings there. Oh, I was talking about how it goes 3D. Oh, thank, thank you, uh, Randy. But um, I'm not sure how, I <laughs> can't remember how that relates to what I was about to say about the museum. Um, oh, yeah, now I remember. Okay, so, um, so there's a painter named um, Harnett um, who, um, I think, I'm trying to remember his first name. Anyway, he... Um, specialized in Trump Loy. He was one of the first American artists to specialize um, and to be very successful in this um, this effect. So you're looking at something that's a painting, but it looks like something like a scrap board with things pinned to it and different objects around it. And then it's painted like the wood that the scrap board is against with straps and everything. And you can look at that and just your brain just wants to see it as like that it's real till you get right up on it and you can see the brushwork and the, and the paint. But it really does um, fool your eye quite a bit. Um, thank you, Randy, for <laughs> helping me trace my thought back. <laughs> I don't think I would have ever gotten there. Okay, so um, so she, if you look at the tip of her nose, it does have a bit of that a shadow underneath it. And then there's, I like to call it tension, where things are pulled tighter together than um, they would normally, that there's the, um, something that's under a little bit of strain or stress. And the tip of her nose and her upper lip are pulled fairly close together. So... There's a little bit of a tension from the pout um, expression that she's making. And so I only can get that by sort of um, playing up the accents that are around around that to get that kind of feeling of all that push up. And, and then the shape of her lips, the corner of her lips are then in contrast pulled down. And that's um, really adding to that expression. So I can just diligently copy what's there, or I can try to understand it from more of a physical level, and that just helps me get there much quicker. Um, you know, that's, I think, in a way, that's where some photorealists, I don't want to talk about all photorealists, but some miss out because they're so diligently painting from shape to shape that they're missing some of that gesture that... Um, that's helping define some of those forms. And so it, it is when the one thing that um, gets often left out with um, painters that paint much tighter is that gesture. And that so if you see something that looks photographic but it feels a little bit stiff, um, it is because of that, the, the omission of the gesture. And when I mean gesture, uh, when I say gesture, I do mean those things like things that are intention and compression, that um, that are extension, that you really feel the the tonality of the muscles and the and the um, expressions that are used to make the muscles that are used to make certain expressions or gesture. You really feel that when someone get, understands that the gestural part of that. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm the absolute expert at that, but at least um, I know to look for some of these things. And then I, as I'm painting, I'm kind of making those same expressions with my face to kind of get um, the feel of what that feels like. 
as I'm painting it. And if I look at the painting and I feel it back when I look at it, then I know that I'm getting it. Um, not quite there with this one with their lips, but um, will it's it's fairly close. And I think that some of that is restating the dark separation in her lips um, as an example and getting that in the right place. And I don't quite got the fullness yet of her lower lip. I'm going to just grab a little bit of black and a little bit of that alizarin permanent to get kind of a, a dull rose, darky, dark-ish um, shadow, I should say. There we go. So now I'm starting to feel, and then I can pull the corner of that, of her lips up just a little bit, again, to feel that kind of little bit of a, a smile in her expression. And then this part, of, this edge of her cheek gets a little bit lost, so I'm just going to rub that out, um, reinforce how soft that edge is and then also reinforce the the shadow that's there okay so little edges are just you know in terms of likeness um, i don't have the placement absolutely perfect yet um, but it depends if in the end it really needs it um, if I got the overall expression right, and some of the forms are just off a little bit, so the expression isn't perfect, but you feel the um, the volume in her face, then then it can also be a very successful painting without being truly a portrait. Um, it can be more of a um, either a head study or more of a just. Uh, I don't want to say generic, but more just a painting of a head as opposed to a portrait of, of somebody. So sometimes it's good to make a decision about some of those things as you're going. Do you want it to be a painting or do you want it to be a portrait? Not to say that a portrait isn't a painting, but a painting is something that can just stand on its own. And a portrait um, doesn't need to do quite as much because it's in a way it's just trying to look like the person and more than trying to be a trying to be a painting a true just a a, a piece of art here i'm sort of getting myself into trouble because um, i'm trying to um, sort of delineate the difference between an art and portrait art which is also art and i know I, I, someone's going to give me a nasty comment saying well I'm a portrait artist, and I make portraits that are art. Um, but let's see, maybe, maybe my viewers will be more forgiving. Um, okay, the mouth looks like chocolate. Well, right now it does. Um, and I will, again, sometime later I might go through and define some of those things a little bit um, more exactly going to need to soften up the corner here and this line the shadow is sort of fighting against the movement that I'm trying to create so I I can play around with this a little bit to to help it um, come up more in the direction that I want Whew, it's a little bit warm here tonight I'm going to take a big noisy swig of water here in a second okay my goal with this painting tonight is to really capture the face and some of the hair and then leave some of the maybe a little bit around her neck and shoulders and some, a bit of her dress but overall the dress and the background and the hair I, I'm, I'm content to try to finish another night yeah sorry about the gulping but what I wanted to say was that the um, the uh, I'm adding the safflower oil to my um, to my um, my brush tin my my cleaning tin here is that um, I really want to slow down that drying time a, a little bit 
so that I have the luxury to um, work on different paintings and come back and have a little bit more wetness. If I wanted to push that much more than I could, um, I could make it almost pure um, safflower oil, but I um, didn't have enough um, to do that. And I'm not willing to pour in um, cooking oil. <laughs> I think that I would destroy the painting that way, but have some in the cabinet. Okay, so um, let me get that other eye in. I think that's going to help me visualize where I am with the, all of this. Coming in a little bit with the, something close to black for the iris of the eye. And then I want to get, again, that blue, light blue in that I already have mixed up. And need the that sort of dark edge of the um, of the upper and lower eyelids to define the shape of the eye. Okay, and and I'm gonna carve a little bit her eyebrow, which got a little bit too um, too thick. Okay, so I have sort of a little bit of this rainbow thing going on my palette. I don't know if you can really see it, but um, allows me to shift from one hue to another in a very narrow um, color range, very narrow value range. And then I always can come in with more white or more black or more uh, pure uh, color from my transparent colors to, to move lighter and darker as I need to, or even um, more intense as I need to put down um, cleaner color to get a certain level of intensity. So I'm just going to try to match a little bit better the color here on the on that upper part of her cheek coming into her eye. And I know that um, that her, I need to better define her eyelid, but her eyelid is so foreshortened. I'm only just seeing a little edge of it. And then I'm kind of seeing this, um, the flesh that's underneath the eyelid, but above the the, um, the cheek itself. Have a little color shift here to orange around here. And then I kind of go a little more purple. I exaggerate, oop, got a little bit too much purple there. Needed much more white. Let's clean that up a little bit. Um, so a little bit of um, light-ish purple coming in around the um, edge of the bridge of the nose. And I need to be just a little bit darker along the bridge itself. Darker, redder, orange. Let's see if I can get the right color mixed up here. Yeah, something like that. So I got little accents. I have too big a brush here to really um, do it well, but it doesn't exactly hurt me because I do want a bit of freshness in the paint and having that bigger brush really does help maintain that. Okay, I think everything technically is still working. It's 10 o'clock. I'm about an hour in. I really have to be vigilant now because this is where things tend to um, crap out on me a little bit. Okay, really need to focus on getting the fullness of her face. And that's just by maybe blending or coming in with um, fresh... Um, a bit of color each time getting make sure I have enough um, paint on the brush when I come back in so that I'm not only just um, blending that I'm really I am coming in with new color on top of the color and getting some of these ala prima um, ala prima effects in the paint okay and then if you can see the shadow on her nose, it has this um, curve shape, and that's helping describe the contour of the nose. 
um, those little things they're just little bits of information that help our brain process the shape and the volume um, it would be really easy to miss those little things you just have to know like oh if I if I'm going to describe the shape of the nose um, how what little clues are there in the photo that are going to help me or what things can I put in even if they're not in the photo that are going to help me describe that including this bit of um, highlight that's right here right in the middle of the nose there that's sending a signal to our brain that there's a it's reflecting a little bit of light right in that spot And again, need to emphasize that curve that's happening right there. Okay, starting to get there. There's going to be a thousand little adjustments that I make here as I go. That's really to start to um, capture what's going on here in this photo. The trying to get the depth of the colors and the values without having to paint every last little detail. I just trying to get the overall impression. Again, there's some spots on her nose. And I'm going to call it a reddish orange that's very light. So I need to clean up my color a little bit. Get some white and yellow in there. And that's these um, these lights in the nose. I'm not light enough. So that's reading as a dark spot instead of reading like the light is hitting her face and that's uh, on that tip of the nose. Here, that's better. That's the right value. And sorry, I'm bumping the my phone a little bit, so sorry about the shaking in advance. Just to be a little careful, more careful with the drawing around those um, very delicate nostrils. So I need to try to get those shapes in there. Okay. And I think this dark that I put in is both too dark and not enough color in it. So because I have really covered everything with a fair amount of generous paint, then I really have to... Um, come in much lighter or darker or more colorful as needed to compensate for the paint that's already um, laid down. Again, she, um, you can feel the corner of her nostril here. It's just coming up a little bit higher than you might expect. So just, again, tricking telling your brain to keep on looking to see what's there and not what it thinks it's there. But I want to get that feeling of the nostril there, and so I do need the accent color that's behind it. There. Okay. It's slowly starting to read. There's a lot more subtlety there that I'm missing, and so as a consequence, more than just subtlety, the um, the transitions and colors in and the sort of reflectiveness of the paint that I put down is not clean enough in some areas for it to really um, read that well. So, okay. I do have to start really comparing and making sure that the contour of her face and the expression of the face are right, that are feeling right. Let's go more orange in this spot. And I know that I have to go more yellow right there along the edge of that. And this is a, an opportunity for me to really play with um, kind of like impressionistic colors here in the shadow side of her face because I have something that's really close in value all the way around but is shifting colors back and forth. For example, where the light is reflecting back into her chin, I have this very light green. I have to get a lot of white in the green to get the right color and a touch of yellow. 
And that is right. I'm not. I'm not light enough. Hold on. Let me try it again. Right here, you can start to feel that light reflecting back up into her chin, and then just right next to that, right, right next to that is the shadow that's underneath her chin there. I'm gonna carve into that just a little bit. Okay, so that's what um, drawing the eye and also separating those forms in her face, the shadow has helped pushing um, that chin forward. And the relatively darker value of her chest is then um, helping it sit back in space. Okay, so I'm going to indicate some of the color of her dress. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to paint this whole painting tonight. Um, and part of the reason for that is that if I paint in little patches, then I'm able to get the sort of a la prima. Um, effects going but um, if I try to do that all over I'm not going to get any of it done and then it's going to dry up and then I will sort of lose that ability to paint a la prima in those areas that have have dried out okay went a little bit too green there so let's see if I can get a little bit pure um, phthalo blue and the white A little bit better but I know so this is where having very intense color is helpful because then when you add a lot of white to it which tends to knock the intensity of the color down you still have a fair amount of tinting strength in the color that allows the color allows you to hang on to quite a bit of color as you go lighter and lighter okay so that's about the color I want it's only going to pop if I have her flesh tones dark enough that are alongside of that. It went really way too cool there and need quite a bit more red in the color, but I can come in and a la prima it by just coming in and painting right in on top. So still my paints aren't wet enough to sort of overcome the dryness of the surface. So adding a little bit of the Gambolin thinner, which is a, um, a, a mineral spirit that's used for both cleaning my brush and for also thinning out the paint. And this just evaporates off completely so that, um, so that then it's not really affecting the film of the paint. As I paint, you can put too much thinner where you're breaking the 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 binder of the paint, so it's not it's losing its kind of film uh, quality to it, and will become sort of more um, dry and chalky. And so sometimes when you look at a surface of your painting and it feels like it just feels really dry, looks like it's dry. That's because um, you've thinned it out so much that that the film of the binder which would give it kind of a glossiness um, it's stretched out so thin that it no longer really holds the paint on the surface um, like it's designed to it's really just more starts to get very chalky and dry and almost like um, pebbly in a sense um, and just um, in a way you can sort of burnish it into the surface of the paint if you wanted but you're not going to get that kind of healthy um, shiny skin that um, the paint would develop on the surface normally okay i have to come up a little bit lighter here just a tad i'm trying to get that shape in the deltoid that i see in the photo which is um, a little bit darker here. This curves a little bit here. And then there's that separation in the armpit that I have to indicate something like this. And it comes under. Okay. I'm just going to carve into that a little bit, make it a bit softer. Okay. 
good. Okay, I have her looking a little bit like a weightlifter, and part of that is that I have given her too much depth or too much height to her shoulder. And if I trim that down a little bit, it will start to look right. Okay, so what can I do quickly that will help me see things a little bit? I am going to throw in the, the green of the grass that's behind her a little bit. Just going to very brushily put that in and added a lot of um, thinner right now to the paint so it's just going to show all the kind of brush marks as I do that. Okay. Again, I want to make sure that I'm um, that I'm adjusting that um, contour that I had painted a little bit too too roughly. And then on the outer edge of the shoulder, you can see there's almost like a black outline on it. And that just means that that's where shadow is coming in again on the far side. Something like that. And you want to get that tricep sticking out. Start to get the shape of that arm. And then there's a little bit of lighter color here in bands. And then I got kind of a very cool pink that sits right up here. Okay, just going to paint a little bit without saying too much. Okay, so Randy says, can you explain the Ala Prima effects, i.e. more paint or color instead of blending that you mentioned briefly? Okay, so one of the really great things about oil paint is the ability to get very soft edges. And you can get those soft edges, one, by sort of blending out or uh, painting over paint that's already down. Or you can come in with, um, with fresh paint on top of wet paint. And that, what that does is that you're literally mixing the colors right on the surface of the, the painting itself, as opposed to mixing everything um, the every color that you want on the palette and then putting it down on sort of very um, very carefully like value and color in each spot kind of like a paint by numbers approach Alla Prima is the exact opposite of paint by numbers what that allows you to do is you can come in with lots of thick color and you can then as you're blending, I'm, this is not a great example because there's not a lot of paint down already, but if I go into a spot that does have a lot of color, a lot of paint down already, like the edge of this wall that starts to have this kind of mossy green color there, then I can come in with wetter paint on top and you can see, you can see something that looks like the paint mixing here in each stroke that I put down. So, um, and that creates these really soft and, and dynamic brushstroke effects. Um, this also something called bravura. If you're familiar with um, both John Singer Sargent and Joaquin Soroya um, and William Mary Chase and Zorn are all examples of this brav bravura where you put down these big brushstrokes that very closely go right towards the thing that they're trying to describe. And that just comes with tons of practice and skill to be able to make the brushwork mimic um, visually the thing that you're trying to create. Um, and that is a lot different than coming in with a tiny little brush with a little bit of color at a time and painting one little area. You're trying to make a sweeping a gesture with the paint itself in each one of these areas to try to paint something that in this case for example that feels like the edge of the hair coming into the forehead and I'm getting the paint and the colors all mixing together in one sort of flowy kind of brush stroke or a few just a few brush strokes and that's um, that's the true 
sort of benefit and nature of alla prima painting is that that feeling that you see the brushwork and you see the thing that it's trying to be all at once by painting wet um, paint into a, a wet paint already painted surface where you do have that kind of play of colors. So if you see right there, I came in with some reds right on top of the edge of that hair. So I can kind of get that softening um, reddish shadow that's coming in as the hair starts to cut into the forehead. And it's starting to create that sense of dimension by mixing colors right into colors. Anyway, I hope that explains it pretty well. It is sort of a something that there's a lot of Alla Prima painters out there and and their all their styles look um, distinct from one another. So what you can do with that sort of wet into wet painting approach is it's quite vast the 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 range of techniques and looks and effects that you can get with the paint. So I want to make sure that the the light side of the hair that I'm getting kind of the right overall um, hue. There's lots of blues and reds in that, but and then all going very um, very gray. So let me see if I can get something that's sort of lightish blue in there too. That's maybe a little bit too dark or too intense. Let me see. Get a little bit of black in that because it is sort of gray. You're getting sort of these grays coming in. Just kind of roughing it in. I always can come over with more and more paint to kind of get the right um, color effect going there. Okay, just need a little bit more red in that. Yep, that's starting to look like it. Just a little bit too much white in the paint, so I need to clean up some of those colors. Okay, now I'm squinting down because I really do want to get sort of the the feel and dimension of um, the textures of the hair. Okay, let's keep on working here. Come in, try to get a lot of paint down. Okay, and then I have the hair being lit on top and it's really getting quite reddish and orangish. I'm just going to knock this back quite a bit. Okay, just need to come in with some blacks here start to define the shapes and shadows of the hair so that you start to see the okay used up all my black hold on so defining the shadows the light and shadow of the hair so you really start to see the the dimensionality that sort of chiaroscuro of the of the paint itself let me see this is ivory black at some point i'm going to try to use up that ivory black i'm just so um, very intent on trying to un work with this um, chromatic black and kind of get used to it and understand how it mixes. So I have to keep on generally using it and have not been completely happy with the ivory black. Um, there is areas where I've gone thicker in some paintings, hoping that I can get a nice um, flat black and it ends up just reflecting so much light and um, not really coming off as being black um, when I, especially when I photograph it. Um, so here I can get really dark right there. And then I have the under edge of that shadow. So it doesn't take much to get kind of the sense of texture of the hair. Now I'm going a little bit Bob Rossi on you guys by just making um, some of these more um, personalized marks that have nothing to do with the, the photograph itself. Um, but just trying to create sort of a little bit of a, 
a texture rendering in the in the hair a little bit. It's not going to take much because I can then come in with a light and do something that just feels like um, starting to look like tighter curls as I go. So I can even put in little like flex, and then you start to then start to feel the the surface of this whole thing. Try to make that um, shadow area a little bit higher. And that shadow, where that shadow is, is very important because it is kind of marking off where the the upper edge of her her head actually sits. Because this is where this spot here is where the the hair in the front attaches to her scalp, and then the top of her head is just beyond that. So again, that placement starts to be pretty important. Soften that edge between the light and the dark area. Okay, so that's going to take quite a bit of um, refining before that starts to look right. So I'm just going to move on. You guys kind of got the, the overall idea of it, of that huge mass of hair. It's got some light greens back here too to define that that edge that's back here. Okay. Um, so Randy says yes. Fantastic explanation. Always assumed. Um, just get the right shape right value each little place then move to next shape more of copy copy than a la prima love it okay well great glad um, glad that helps that's why I'm here I suppose not only here for my own enjoyment just trying to teach you guys something also if I can do all of that at the same time happily just painting 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 but I have the the uh, YouTube live turned on so um, don't always feel like doing this live but on Tuesday nights then it's um, it's just part of the program I'm trying to get that turn of the shoulder in the right place and then if you remember I'm trying to really get that foreshortening working there or not have just this little stubby um, arm because I didn't do the foreshortening correctly. Need some reds, some lighter reds for this, or I should say darker reds for the shadow that's on the shoulder. And then this really goes into the, about the only place here that you're actually getting direct light on the, on the forms of, on her skin. Okay, I'm going to have to go a lot lighter there. I can almost come in with pure white because I already have quite a bit of color down already. Okay, and this uh, contour of the shoulder just comes down a little bit more directly. Okay. So I've got enough, I think, around the hair and the dress to really go in and explore and refine the face a little bit more. So that's my challenge. In the next 40 minutes, I want the face to be um, close to what I call being done. Um, I'm not going to probably be able to finish the face perfectly because just I'm sort of stuck in my seat here and it makes it really need to get up and um, look back and forth between the, the photo and the and the painting itself to see where the painting is a little bit off. And again, this is only because I'm trying to be close to what the painting looks like. And it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, perfect. But um, if that's my goal, then I want to be able to use all the tools possible to try to get close to that without maybe um, tracing um, some of the photo to begin with. I, um, 
I don't uh, necessarily um, am anti-tracing. Um, I think it's a great tool. It's great to be able to um, speed some things along for some people. I just don't think it's the right um, tool for everything. And I do, um, well, I think anyone can paint however they feel like. I just think when some instructors have YouTube um, information on how they paint and they're always working from an already drawn um, likeness or already drawn figure and that you never see how that drawing is done but you can tell by the contour of the lines in the drawing that it was traced onto the panel and again I don't see anything wrong with that in itself I just think it's wrong to put on demos for people to how to do something, but because of some level of embarrassment, you hide the fact that it, um, that it was traced. And so then when those people try to follow you, try to imitate what you're doing, they're already at a disadvantage because they don't see that you actually um, traced it on again fine as if that's part of your process but at least tell people who you're trying to teach um, that that's what you're doing um, that's that's sort of where my my beef is and all of that um, is you are doing sort of just service to those people that you're you're teaching you're kind of admitting an important aspect of how you got there so um, so that said I don't I don't tend to trace, it's not part of my natural process. And I like the, the irregularity that comes out of trying to, um, trying to figure it out on your own, trying to figure out, trying to match a photo, but just using your, your eyes to accomplish it. And, and a lot of measuring. Okay, so not really getting that under area underneath the eyelid the right value so i'm going to go a little bit darker um, randy says i agree uh, why hide yeah so i'm not going to do it here but i could point to a few artists that are on youtube that have um, fairly big following um, on their channel they have hundreds of videos but you can't find one video of how they actually drew on the panel and so that's when I know that um, that's how they got there that's not to say that they don't have the drawing skill but I think it does in a way weaken a little bit of their drawing skills because I can see I can see it in the finished product that there was um, uh, some misunderstanding of what the the changes of, of values and colors that were in the original photo because um, because some of the mistakes in the, the drawing in underneath the painting and when I say in the drawing is the, the structure of the form is not um, supporting well the the idea of the painting and the in the forms that are there so so when I say the forms that are that are evident from the photo um, aren't really showing up in the painting quite as quite as uh, convincingly and uh, and that only comes from um, you know drawing and drawing in my case I do a lot of drawing with paint so when I practice my drawing I'm actually doing it in the painting process itself and I do lots of painting so that gives me lots of opportunities to practice my drawing skills. I would miss out on that if I was doing a lot of tracing. Some would say though, and I've seen it said and written that tracing, just because you're tracing doesn't mean that you're, um, that you're missing out on the drawing skills because the act of tracing itself to do it well, you do have to bring good drawing skills to it to some degree. And I will have to agree that agree to that, but um, a lot of that is um, evident when you see the finished work. Um, 
with tracing or not, if someone has excellent drawing skills, then you will see that in the finished painting. If they don't have excellent drawing skills or they have mediocre drawing skills, then that tends to the act of always tracing, always tracing, does negatively impact that over time. Sorry, I did go on a long rant there for a while, so you have to forgive me. Um, I think I did one um, YouTube tutorial that was about the importance of drawing and drawing skills, and uh, has um, it has it's a one called Remy is the uh, the tutorial and it's called drawing controversy is the title and so i go into that quite a bit even more in depth about why i think developing drawing skills is an important aspect of painting okay and just cutting into the form of the ear a little bit with this big lock of curlyish hair. Let's see if I can get some of the the ingredients there. Okay, so now if I if I flick back and forth between the painting and the photograph, now I can really start to see where um, where my drawing is off and where some of my values are off, and just have to really just keep on coming back in with a new contour line and new um, colors and values to um, to get the right shapes of things and the right values but like i said i can really start to see it now more better now that i have a lot of the the paint and color in of that eyebrow a little bit. So I'd like to, if I do it right and I get the values, the colors all working, then I, and if I get the softness of the forms in her face, then this will start to look somewhat photographic. And when I say photographic, I don't mean like a copy of a photo. I mean, you start to get a sense of realism in the painting itself. Like you look at it and you wonder if it's if it's a painting or a photograph at first. Obviously, I show a lot of indication of the brushwork that no one's going to be completely fooled, or at least not for very long, because all you have to do is really look at the painting itself, and you can see all of the brush, a lot of the brushwork that's in there. Gotta open this um, light area up here. And here I'm just doing a little bit of blending. I'm not going crazy. I'm just trying to soften up an edge a little bit or bring some of these um, transitional colors and values together a little bit as they're just uh, a little bit too strong. Okay now starting to get it. This eyebrow, I don't have it tilted quite at the right angle. And this is just, you know, coming in and, and comparing Then I can really start to see how this eyebrow goes up here and then down towards the center. And try to do the same with this eyebrow. So where am I missing the boat? This contour of the shadow is not helping describe the form because I don't have it quite um, flowing in the right direction. There. Okay, so got about a half hour left, which is good because I'm starting to feel the length of the day um, hitting me a little bit. Woke up very early this morning, did a full day at the office, um, had several meetings, and um, came home, made dinner for everybody, and um, 
and now doing this live painting. So now I'm starting to feel it. And then I got to um, wake up early in the morning, um, do carpool lunches made by um, six in the six thirty in the morning. Get out the door to to drive everybody to school. So um, just um, while painting is, for me is totally relaxing. I can do it for hours and hours into the middle of the night, and I often do, and I feel sometimes I don't feel as tired as I should be because I'm kind of super relaxed while I'm painting. Doing the live videos, however, it's a little bit different story because I, it is a little bit of a performance and you kind of have to be on. And um, just that that um, lack of the ability to just slow down and pace yourself kind of um, goes out the door a little bit. I'm using this small brush when I really should be using a little bit bigger brush, so I'm going to try to switch it up a little bit and get this really big fat brush going. Um, so far, so good. Everything technically seems to be in my favor, which is great. Um, I want to carve the hair a little bit back here a little bit. I know that um, I'm, I have a lot more corner here in this in this corner than there should be, so I know that the hair is coming out more. It's just feeling so darn massive, um, but I just it doesn't quite have the right shape yet as part of the problem. It really is coming out a lot further, and then it's um, dropping almost straight down the side here, and then getting uh, a lot of black. something like that. She does have a lot of hair. Okay, and then kind of have, I needed to slope a little bit more out this way, and then this edge is going to be a little bit soft. I need to have, I mean, she doesn't really have bangs, but she does. And so those kind of have to follow, come out forward. I need to get that foreshortening working here because that's the part of the, the hair that's still not feeling quite right. Okay, almost out of white here. That's making me struggle a little bit. So let's. Um, get out my radiant white and put a little more down. I just had bought a new tube of this because I went through with all of these um, pieces in succession that I'm doing. I went to, through two or three um, tubes of white in about a um, period of two months, which um, generally these do tend to, a tube would tend to last me about um, four or five months. Okay. a lot more white down. I can then get back to it. So I think what's going on here is I don't have her eyes quite high enough. I'm going to carve into them a little bit to push them back up. And I don't have the tip of her nose quite low enough at the same time. So that is sort of changing her facial expression. So I can see that as I'm kind of working more into the, the painting, trying to refine it a little bit more. The, there was just something that is just a little bit off. Okay, gonna have to go and get a big, um, some big gulps of water again soon with that going right into the microphone, so you have to apologize. Yeah, so Randy says her eyes are so huge. Um, I think you're probably referring to the photo itself, not how I have them painted. But yes, they, she has this very, it's almost not that they're so huge, it's more that they're so um, 
round that really give this sort of wide-eyed kind of look to them and capturing that is really hard at the same time she's wide-eyed but she almost looks sleepy so it's trying to get that kind of that really subtle middle ground there and that just takes going back and forth a lot of times until you just get it you know it just takes a while while to get there to keep on adjusting the edges as you go yes Randy says yes he was talking referring to the photo itself so I'm just keep on carving into this and repainting it the, the, the shape of the iris because it is this kind of oval shape but it's sort of at an angle it's really hard to get quite the right feel of it then I have this bit of hair that's coming in actually um, much closer to the eye and then I don't have the, her hairline quite low enough so it's sort of throwing the the drawing off a little bit. So failing to get enough paint on the brush there for a little bit. It's almost like the sound of windshield wipers um, going when the rain's already stopped. You start to hear it. And that's, I'm starting to hear some of these brush strokes because I don't have enough paint on the, on the brush. Okay, so not quite what I, partly what I'm missing is her chin is tucked in and then you start to see the curvature of the forehead. It's just slightly so um, the overall effect is that the head is tilted slightly towards us and I'm losing that because there's pieces of my drawing that are just a little bit off, um, especially here where I should be getting a feeling of the curvature of her of her head right here and I'm not getting that um, partially because maybe I've painted her eyes and um, her eyes too high and then not really giving enough information about the eyelid itself so that you could feel like that sort of pointed down that like you're looking on top of it and then this eyelid is more or less tucked in so you really don't see it. And then I gotta get those eyebrows back up a little bit higher. And this one stops right there. Okay. So where am I off? That's what I keep on asking myself. Where is this off that's not kind of getting the right gesture yet? And some of that is the contour of her cheeks. I can see this cheek is, and where her shoulder comes in, that's too high. Or the cheek cuts much higher, but the shoulder comes in much lower. So really more like this. And I, sh and I could go in and remeasure, but I almost, I almost have her shoulders shrugging and they really don't make that gesture. It's more because her arms are pulled back, her shoulders are dropping down quite quickly. And so making that correction is going to help. Any place where I can find where the thing is significantly off and I can go ahead and correct it, that makes a huge difference on the overall appearance of the painting because you no longer have that one thing that's sort of... Um, running counter to what you're trying to achieve. You're, you want to you want to solve a big problem, take care of the 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 biggest aspects of that problem and you'll have the thing turned around pretty quickly if you're able to. Um, but if you don't recognize what's contributing to a problem, then you're not you're going to have a hard time fixing it. So that's how I kind of see it with the paint. Unless I can see what are the aspects of the underlying drawing that are not um, making something look right? If I can find the biggest, uh, biggest things 
on, in that category that's contributing to the drawing not looking right. Um, by changing those few things, you really are then um, helping it read very quickly, starting to read um, the way you want it to. Okay, that helps. Just little things like just this edge just comes up uh, a little bit higher. I know I softened that edge already once, but that just comes up a little bit higher. There's this darkness here that's pushing the, that information back. And then um, got to make this eye just a little bit higher. Or maybe make the other one lower, one or the other. Okay, that's a little bit better. And I did say, did have the tip of the nose, it's just feeling a little bit too um, high, so I can go ahead and try to paint out the nostrils and try to put them in again, but just a tad lower. that. Okay, that's feeling better. Okay, so about 15 minutes here. I'm going to keep on going in and trying to um, refine the face a little bit. I really would like to have a, um, a flat brush to do something a little bit more like chiseling, but all my flats are, they're so beat up, um, trying to find something that's going to work here for me. Because when I say beat up, um, they're no longer really holding their shape and they're getting get kind of bushy, and that makes it really hard to do that kind of, um, kind of carving sort of brush strokes that I would like. I'm just pulling out a bunch of them to see if I can find one that's going to work for me. Uh -huh. I think maybe this one. It's still beat up, but it's small enough that I can kind of get what I want out of it. And so... Just want to reestablish that tear duct that's there. Not very accurate with this, with this brush, but um, it's still okay for right now. Just as long as I can get close, I can always carve back the other way a little bit. So right now I'm really flicking um, quickly back and forth. When I say flicking, I'm darting my eyes quickly between the photo and the photo and the painting and that very quickly helps me see those color value and placement differences not getting quite the dimension of the eye yet I just don't really have it's partially that I don't have all the parts in there need a smaller brush okay so go back to my little beat up detail brush here. So if I look at the photo and then I look at the eye that I painted, one just looks like a child's drawing right now of an eye. And that's my painting. And the other looks like the photograph of the eye. And so I need a lot more subtlety in the painting before it starts to look um, the way I want. Some of that is just slowing down. I, I say that I, um, I, w I watch some, um, some Jeremy Lipking videos and some um, Dan Gerhardt videos and trying to understand what they're doing. And, and pretty much there isn't that much I really learned from the videos because it was information for the most part that I had learned in art school. Um, 
and so kind of new and some of it I just knew intuitively too just from doing enough paintings but anyway the thing that really impressed me and one of the things that I really struggled with was this sort of sense of accuracy and I thought by looking at their brushwork that they're just um, coming in almost like a fencer and just um, quickly laying down those sort of well, you kind of sometimes think that they're these absolutely jewel perfect strokes and what I learned from watching them in video is that they can paint fairly quickly overall but when it came down to some of these details it was like they were moving in slow motion it was just this long very slowly deliberate movement with a brush to get some of those exacting details and so that was my big takeaway that I really needed to slow down to get uh, and sometimes I say this something isn't going to appear just magically appear in your painting you actually have to paint it you have to paint it that way if you want it to show up that way it's sort of <laughs> kind of sometimes would have these sort of ideas in my head that if I put down like 20% of what um, of what is being seen in the model or the photograph that the rest is just going to magically show up and that that is how some of it works but you kind of have to put down 90% of, of visually what you see to get your brain to fill in the rest of the that 10% that's missing and um, I thought you could get there to just by whipping paint around and it's not true that you do actually have to slow down and deliberately put in things that are there to get them to be part of the finished painting um, but I'm a big advocate of leaving uh, the brain something to some work to do on its own to see the dimensionality of something to um, sort of work that out and let the brain do what it does very well which is sort of that pattern recognition that lets it um, fill in the blanks something that um, a computer or machine can't do very well okay and I gotta come in and soften some of these um, these edges up a little bit and sort of correct correct them as I go there we go that's starting to look a bit better just need to um, soften up this contour here so that it so that it's helping um, support the eye and then I'm going into this really greenish olivey corner here that's not quite the right color, but hopefully I can um, come back in with some yellows and oranges to correct that. Just like that. Yep. Okay. Starting to get it. So what I'm missing is the the right um, the softness and a lot of the transitions, and I'm going to try to get there by just putting down. Um, quite a bit of paint off my brush each time so that I don't get into that bad habit of just blending to get there just blending 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 started mixing the wrong color what kind of a lightish pink for these um, highlights that are on the, the upper part of the forehead Okay, there's this little bit of bang that's here with a little bit of reddish color around it. It's just starting to kind of get there, it's starting to pull together a little bit. It's just taking a, a while, and lots of patience to get there. Sometimes I start off these sessions and I think, oh God, what if I do a horrible painting? And um, if I don't perform and get it to come out the way I want and it's kind of like you can't really think that way you just kind of come in and 
do what you do and just um, just have a little bit of faith that your skills are going to hold help you hold it up and have it come together in the right way so here's where I want to come in with a little more impasto which is the thicker paint to get kind of the feeling of the reflection on her forehead to read correctly a little bit of red but not that red and a touch of orange and a little bit of green and yellow orange right in here that's perfect okay and then I want to make sure that I'm following the hair the way I see it in the photo this isn't the part where I'm getting very creative I'm just trying to do a good job of matching on what's going on in the photo with fairly um, fairly broad brush strokes Okay, so just want to make sure someone's still out there. I see I have five people here watching. Um, if you have any questions, this is the time because I've just got five minutes left here to answer anything that you may want to know about. Um, so ask away if you can. Um, just want to remind um, anyone who's here with me or watches this video later, um, I um, highly recommend that you, if you're interested in seeing more live demos or future tutorials, that you register, um, subscribe to my channel, or um, yeah, subscribe and also hit the notifications icon to be able to guarantee that you will get the notification when I'm adding new videos. Okay, I'm trying to work very quickly here, which is the opposite of what I said to do, um, just because I'm running out of time. But, um, but so this is where I um, hanging it up. I'm sort of giving you signals uh, to stop watching, but I want you to keep on watching until I'm done here, so stick with me. Um, so I um, had done a selection this time where my Instagram followers chose this um, photo over four other ones, but I got such a big response about doing um, a demo with all of them that, um, that I am going to use all of the, the photos in that selection process to um, use as a reference for all of my paintings coming up in the next month and so that is um, um, that's what I plan to do and okay this is about as far as I'm gonna get it tonight um, starting to get the sense of form around the nose and the mouth but don't have all the subtlety quite um, to quite get there yet it's just gonna take a little bit of very patient slow um, brush strokes and sort of the opposite of I'm of, uh, of what I'm doing right now. I'm afraid I'm not going to get there unless I take it offline. So thank you all for coming and watching this video and hope um, this hope that you learned a lot and that um, that you enjoyed it. And I will see you all um, here next week with with a um, new photo and I will post this painting when I do have it finished. Hopefully it will be out in the next um, night or two. Okay, so thank you very much and have a good night.